you ever seen a heart? Me and boys get like Party, aha, me boys delighted. Aha, me boys delighted. Happy Monday. Does anybody have any questions about assignments one or two or life, life in general? <laughs> I know what some of you are thinking. It's a little bit dangerous, isn't it, when the teacher knows what, you're, what some of you are thinking? Some of you are thinking, what's going on with assignment one, Bob? Have you finished grading assignment one? Right? I started grading assignment one in about 20, 20, 30. So the, the first 20 look fine to me. Yeah, they look as they do normally. Nothing unusual that I saw so far. The average, I think, so far is around a 10, something like that. Yeah, it's the average, usual average. I think if I were to say, I would say something like in the upper 60s, maybe, maybe, 70, maybe upper 60s. <clears throat> Does anybody need a copy of the last lecture? Is anybody not here? Because there are some leftover copies. Wow, okay, good. Anybody need a copy of assignment two? Yeah. Would anybody like me to read assignment two for me? <laughs> I wasn't able to read it last time. <laughs> That's a bad time story. Okay, try not to talk all at once, yeah? It's a little bit overwhelming. So we, taught, we started, after I was coughing for 15 minutes last time, we started to talk about marching cubes. And this is a way we can construct surfaces out of volume data. Right? So it's a very special subset of the volume. It's a, a user-specified subset of a surface. And we went through the basic steps. First, we talked about the terminology. What is an ISO surface, an ISO value? And we went through the volume visualization pipeline to see how it fit in there. And then we talked about the marching squares algorithm. And then we just extended marching squares to volumes. Right, and then we started the marching cubes algorithm, and this is how far we got. We talked about all these steps, and then we stopped here, compute gradients. Here's a Monday morning quiz question. Is marching cubes an object order or image order algorithm? Anybody remember those terms? Yeah. Anybody want to guess? You have a 50-50 chance of guessing the correct answer. Anybody want to guess? <coughs> Is it an image order or object order algorithm? The energy is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. 
correct. Say your name again. Rushita. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Rushita. It is object order. Very good, especially for a Monday morning. Probably the test is going to be at a 9 a.m. Monday morning. So it's object order. Anybody know why it's object order? That's this is like a, this is a test question. Well, I have I haven't written the test yet, but that could easily be a test question. So object order algorithms traverse object space, or they traverse the three D space. So this uh, this the first, it's it's a for loop for each voxel or for each cell do. Remember, that's what an object order algorithm is. And if it was an image order algorithm, it would say, for each pixel, do something. So here, it's for each cell or for each voxel, do something. This thing, it can repeat. That's a for loop, right? <clears throat> so that's the idea. So that's a cell there. We classified the indices, then we use that classification to build up an index, and the index points into a lookup table where the lookup table has already stored the matching triangles, right? That's an example of using an index and then looking up that index in the lookup table and then it retrieves the corresponding <coughs> triangles, edge, edges and triangles. And then we, those are two different cases, right, of, of interpolation, the same. And then this is the, one of the confusing steps. So, this this image shows that each triangle has a normal vector, those green vectors, and those are necessary for computing shading. So volume data doesn't have those arrows, right? Volume data is just a set of scalars on a 3D grid, right? So the input is just these scalars here. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And from those eight scalars, we derive this triangle and the ISO value. But if we want to add shading to a surface, we need to add normal vectors. So those are vectors that point out straight out from the orthogonal to the surface. To the surface. To the surface. So this is a step to do that, to compute normal vectors. It says calculate the normal at each Q vertex, right? That's what these things are, using central differences. So a vector has three components, an X, Y, and Z component. And there are no normal vectors already computed. We're deriving them. We're artificially deriving them from the volume data. So for example, to compute the x component of the normal vector at this vertex, we take the x val the, the scalar value here along x and the scalar value here and we subtract the two from each other. That's called central difference, differences, and that's what this first line is, is saying. V x plus one y z, v x minus one y z. So there's v x plus one, and then minus v x minus one x z. V x minus one y z is not shown in the slide. It's the neighbor right here. It's the left neighbor. So we're taking this value and this value, and we're subtracting them. So we're subtracting this one from this one, and we're deriving the x component of the normal vector at that cell vertex. 
That's one. That's only one component, though. The x component. To get a three-dimensional vector, we need three components. So we do the same for y and z in the y and z directions. So y is is we can say is along this direction. So to get the y component, we we subtract this value and this value, right? And we get the y component of the normal vector. And for the z value, it's we subtract this one from this one. And we get, so those are three artificial numbers. They have three gradients. Those are also called gradients. Now that gives us a normal vector at each cell vertex here. So that gives us, if we do, we do that, we perform that gradient computation three times at every vertex. So here, there, 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 there you know, and, and, and all of them. And then you can see these are the normal vectors that we we added into the into the data or we've derived. And then for to shape triangles, we have to linearly interpolate the normal vectors from the cell vertices to the triangle vertices. So that's three more linear interpolations. One for x, one for y, and one for z. The z I hope that makes sense. And when you do that three times, one for each triangle vertex. So one here, one there, one there, and one there. And then you have the three normal vectors for the triangle that you need to add shading. So that's step six. That's one of the most difficult steps to understand. Say. It's a good way to start the day. Does anybody have any questions about that step? Good. So, step seven is also a little bit tricky. So, consider ambiguous cases. So look, here are two, here are, here's a cube, and here's a cube, or a square, and they're both the same, right? We have inside, outside, inside, outside. This one's inside, outside, inside, outside. So the, the surface could be passing this way, right? We compute these four edge intersections in both cases. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But we could we could connect those edges in two different ways, right? The, the surface could be passing through this way or that way. Right? That's so called an ambiguous case. Right. And and here's another here's this here's another ambiguous case in three three dimensions, right? So that's inside and inside. This one's inside and inside. Here we have two surfaces or, or, or two, two triangles that are separated. And here we have one continuous surface or one continuous set of triangles. And they're both, up until now, they're both valid triangulations of the same square or the same cube. The, the 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 solution is to pick the right one. <laughs> Any ideas how that could be done? That's an advanced question. If you knew the answer to that question, that would be impressive. So there's another. There's, that's what happens that if you choose the wrong. The wrong case, you end up with holes in the surface. 
So if we choose the wrong case, these are two cubes, and if we've chosen the wrong case for one of the cubes, the, the top one, the top here, and this, all the surfaces should be continuous. So there's a continuous surface that's correct. Right? So actually we want always continuous surfaces. We don't want surfaces with holes in them. So here's one solution. Well, what another one solution? One solution, one simple solution, by the way, is just to subdivide the cube. So subdivide it into four cubes. Right? Compute the middle point with interpolation, and then look at the middle point to see if it's inside or outside the surface. But that's not shown here. But it wouldn't be, it's not very difficult to just compute the middle point, right, right here, to find out if it's inside or outside. If it's inside the surface, then we have this case. If it's outside the surface, then we have this case. And then that, that's what this, this solution is based on. This solution assume, makes an assumption it makes an assumption that the surface passes through twice. In this case, and in this case, we may just make an assumption. And then it computes the value at this point in the middle based on interpolation. If this value matches these ones, then it's correct, then the assumption that we made at the beginning is correct. If it doesn't, if this value doesn't, is not on the same side of the surface, then this assumption is incorrect, and we have the other case. So it's similar, very similar. Right? So one solution is just to assume the way that the surface is oriented test to see if it actually is, and if it's not, it's the other case. And that's the last step, is consider ambiguous cases. So this is just a little summary. We have 256 cases altogether, but the, the, the number of unique configurations of the cube uh, is only 15. And these are the ones, 3, 6, 7, 10, 12, 13, that are ambiguous, which is kind of a lot, actually. So we have to do a lot of this testing for ambiguous cases. And the maximum number of triangles we can generate for any given cube is 5, anywhere from 0 to 5. And these are some examples of isosurfaces. Those are multiple isosurfaces, by the way. One, two, three over there. There's these, looks like four to me. One color for each surface. These are different surfaces in flow, or flow visualization. And those are the two surfaces in a flow, fluid flow. Those are some more isosurfaces. I think I have some, some animated isosurfaces. The details are in this paper, so which is there's a copy of this paper on Blackboard, but you can also Google it and get the PDF. It's one of the top cited papers in, in the whole field of computer science. I, I read that paper, and I recommend you do too. To if you if you're thinking, oh, that one of the steps is difficult to understand, and so on. Let's see if we can we can get some of these examples.
This is a time dependent, a time dependent isosurface, right? So it's changing over time, right? And it shows the 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 hole in the ozone layer as it's expanding and shrinking, contracting and, and expanding. This is another example. That's our Halloween example, even though Halloween's not past. That's, that's not essential. Any questions about the marching cubes algorithm? It's quite a well-known, quite a famous algorithm. It's, it's a great, a great contribution to visualization. Everybody sign the attendance register last around. Okay, so one one of the let's say Limitations of the marching cubes algorithm is that it makes a binary decision. So that means every data sample is either on the inside, the outside, or directly on the surface. And those surfaces, those are mathematical surfaces, so they have zero width. But that, that's an approximation of reality. Well, it's always an approximation of reality. But there are no such thing as zero width surfaces in, in reality, in the physical, natural world. Right? So all of our surfaces have some width, or they occupy some volume. Right? Our skin is not infinitely thin. Well, for some people. <laughs> no, our yeah, skin is not infinitely thin, and our bones are not infinitely thin, right, those, those are, it would be nice if we could model surfaces that have a thickness to them rather than just infinitely thin surfaces, and maybe we don't make a binary decision about something being inside or outside a surface, because another factor is uncertainty, so the data Every data sample has an uncertainty associated with it, some error measurement, right? Everybody learned that in school, probably. When you look at a thermometer, right, and it says 19 degrees, it's not exactly 19 degrees, right? There's some error associated with the thermometer, right? It's plus or minus a half a degree, right? Because all those measuring instruments have some uncertainty associated with them, and that's true about all measuring instruments, right? So that's another thing with the isosurfacing algorithm. It implies certainty, but it's not certain because the data is not certain, right? So it would also be nice if we had some algorithm that didn't imply so much certainty. So we're going to talk about that too. Right, and we're going to talk about direct volume visualization. Right, and that, that's what this is, this is all about. And that's the motivation behind direct volume, volume visualization is, is to accommodate for Surfaces that are not infinitely thin, and data that's not 
infinitely certain. So this is called d direct volume visualization. Oh, good, good, good observation. Yes, somebody's awake. This, these are the notes. I'll start over here. Just this. The attendance register. Attendance register, everybody. Anyone else? So marching cubes can be also be called indirect visualization technique because we're visualizing interpolated samples rather than the samples directly. So this is uh, something where we're looking at the samples directly. There's no intermediate representation like slices and surfaces. Real 3D means there's a depth to the surfaces. They're not infinitely thin, like in, in arching cubes. Right? In computer graphics, they're infinitely thin in all of your computer games. And the way we can, we can carry out direct volume visualization, there are many different ways we can do that, and we're going to talk about it different ways to do that. It's not all of them, but just some of them. And this is something that's really, for a lot of you, is something really new. I think for a lot of you, marching cubes was quite new. And this is also continues to be something very new. Something you've probably never seen before or heard of before. So that makes it that much more exciting. There's also a lot of new terminology that we introduce for this as well. So the first term is called ray casting. Who, some people did take computer graphics. Did anybody ever take computer graphics and then the way the lecturer talked about ray casting? Okay, was that, that was here, right, Andy? Yeah? Nice. So this, for you, you this is this is going to be a little bit familiar, but you may you may have heard the term ray tracing too, not ray casting. Anyways, so ray casting. What is ray casting? The value of each pixel in the image is determined by sending a ray through the pixel into the scene. Right. So this is where us looking at the screen and then computing the pixel values by sampling the volume along the array that's passing through the, the volume, right? And what does that mean? It means computing a red, green, blue, and alpha value for every pixel, because right? those are the values of every pixel. But if I zoom in, with my magnifying glass on, on this screen or on any screen, I can see the individual red, green, and blue values of the pixels. Has anybody ever done that? You can actually see that the individual red, green, and blue values. Maybe we should have that as a homework assignment. Like, get a magnifying glass and look at those. Huh? Thank you, Ms. 20 percent. 20 percent. Yeah, 20%. <laughs> now on the right image, this is this is also called a sampling technique. To sample the volume. Does anybody know what that term means to sample something? Cut it. That would be like slicing, right? To sample something. What does it mean to sample something? I'm going to start calling people from the audience. I haven't really done, done this very well so far. The particular part of a volume 
or particular area of my life. Yeah, what's the whole sentence? The to sample something means something to has take a part of a particular volume. Take a part. part. So a cut out a part. Percentage of consider a little proportion. Consider. It means to consider. Consider like a take. Like take. A fact. Yeah. Or examine. Or examine. We're getting close. We're getting close. To take the three values of continuous source. Data. What's your name? Dave. Dave. We're getting close. We're getting close. You could, uh, one way to say it is to, to take values from. So, you use this word usually <laughs> at, at a party, right? You, some, you arrive at a party and somebody says, oh, did you try the food? And you say, you might say yes, or you might say no, right? And then the response is always, oh, I'm going to sample. I'm going to go take a sample. I'm going to go sample the food, right, to see if it's any good. So it, it's, it's taking measurements of, in this case. So if I wanted to sample the temperature of this room, I would get out a thermometer, and I would choose locations in the room to take samples from, right? So that's what this means, to take, to take measurements of, or probe, probe could be another word. So look at this example. There's a ray, here's a pixel in an image, the image plane, and it's being cast into the volume. And it's sampling the volume along this edge of this straight line. So what happens? It hits the edge of the volume, right? And it starts sampling the volume. The first thing it encounters is the value of air, right? In this case, it samples it gets air. And then we move into the volume by some unit of, of distance, and we get the density of air again, right? And that's what this is showing, the density of air, right, which is low. And then suddenly we hit an object, for example, the skin, and the density value that we get, that we sample at that location, increases. And then we step into the volume by another unit, and then we might dip it down again if we hit soft tissue, and then we move into the volume some more, and we, we hit a high density value corresponding to bone, and we can plot those, those densities or, or, or intensities on a graph. That's what this graph is. That's a sample, a sampling graph. These are all the samples that we took plotted on a graph. The x value is the depth into the volume, and then the y value is the density, or the actual sample, the value of the sample that we got. Right? That's, what's, that's what we're doing here. So ray, cast, ray casting is, is, in this case, a sampling technique. Right? And here's that same idea, right, that on the, on the x-axis we have the depth into the volume, and on the y-axis we have the actual sample values that we collect along each ray, and this is what the, the intensity profile looks like, or the, the set of densities along one ray in the volume. That's what that graph is. Now, those, these are all rays that cast into the volume. The, the, the way that we sample the volume can change. We can make arbitrary choices about which samples we project back to the image plane. Right? 
So it's just like going to the buffet in a, par in a party. You do the same thing. When you sample the food, you're trying to find your favorite food. And that's going to be different for everybody. So which food, that plate of food you bring back, is going to be different for everybody. Right? So these ray functions are like different plates of food. You're sampling the food in different ways. So the one's called maximum intensity projection, one's called compositing, one's called x-ray, one called, one's called first hit. So maximum intensity projection returns the maximum value that it finds along the ray. So that's shown up here. It samples the volume, it finds the most intense or the highest value, and it returns that value. That's like maximum, for me that would be like maximum spice for the food. Although I like spicy food, so I would try to find the maximum intensity curry function. So I would have the plate with the spiciest food. Another way to sample the volume would be with this compositing which just means a little bit of everything, right? Some people will go to the buffet and just take some of everything. That's what compositing is. It just, every time it finds a sample, it just adds it to its current value. And it adds them up. It adds up all the, the, the values. The x-ray is taking an average value, so it adds up all the sample values it encounters and then takes the average. That's like going to the buffet, picking up a little bit of everything, and then stirring it up and mixing it together into one sort of one flavor. And then first it is just saying, return the first sample value of interest, the first non-zero sample value, whatever you hit first. So in the buffet example, it would be the nearest piece of food that you have encounter at the buffet. Those are four different ray tracing, sam ray casting sampling functions, right, or ray functions. Right, there are four different ways of sampling the, the, the volume data. That's a little bit abstract, I, I understand that. So that's why we're going to look at some not so abstract examples. So this is what, what happens if you use direct volume rendering to rent, and, and then combine it with first hit, the first hit ray function. So this is sampling the volume data and then returning the first value that we hit back. That's, that's going to be the skin, right? If we're ignoring the air and the volume in this case. This is what, what happens if we turn, return an average value. And that's what's similar to our x-rays that we get when we go to the hospital. This is what it looks like when we return the maximum value right, in a volume data. And we're going to see more examples of that, by the way. These are not the only examples. But in this case, it looks like a set of blood vessels. And this is something like accumulation where we just take, we add up each value that we encounter, and we look at the sum of values. This is it, which is not much different from the average value. It's a little bit different, but not, not a lot different. Right, and these are some more, some more uh, examples. Right, those are those example. So the point is you can 
you can create different kinds of images depending on which sampling function you use or which ray function you use to sample the volume data. Right? You have to decide, you have to make some sort of a decision. Given a set of volume data, what subset of it do I want to see? Because you can't see everything at the same time. If you try to see everything at the same time, you would just see the block. Right? You just see the size of a block. So it's a question about what you want to see. Okay, we have one slide that on this topic called classification. Is anybody taking computer vision? The computer vision, isn't there a computer vision module? One person, two. So this is a big, big topic that you probably started to talk about in computer vision. So we're just going to have the one slide, but this is a whole separate module, actually, actually this one slide. Right. Could be, yeah. So this means assigning each data value to some <coughs> meaningful object, instead of it just being a number, it gets assigned to an object. So you can imagine a range of densities being identified as skin and a range of densities being identified as hair and soft tissue and bones. So ordering the objects, bones, skin, muscles, <coughs> and then assigning those values or those ranges to different things that we know, right? And this can be done manually, like a person does it. It can, be, and it can also be done semi-automatically. The goal, the ultimate goal, is to be able to do this fully automatically. That still hasn't happened quite yet. Okay. But we're going to talk about a way to approximate this classification using transfer functions, which I haven't mentioned. I haven't said what they are yet. <clears throat> so what is a transfer function? Back in the day when I looked up this term transfer function, this was a while ago, I, this term is used a lot in volume visualization, a lot. But I couldn't find any definition. I looked in all my books and, and, and Wikipedia and everything, and I couldn't find a definition. That was a while ago, though. So I made a definition. That's what this definition is. Transfer function is an operation that maps scale values in 3D to color, opacity, and material values. So you could call it also a sampling op a sampling operation. If you you can now today open some textbooks like the one referenced at the end of this lecture and find definitions of transfer functions, other definitions, but they'll be very very similar. So this is something very new for probably all of you. Has anybody ever heard of a transfer function before? This is going to be something very new for you. So what is that? This is an example of a transfer function, by the way. The previous slide was the definition. So here we have an image, right? And the image that we see here was defined by a transfer function. So it takes, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ray function that decides which colors and opacities are mapped to the data samples. So along the x, the x axis is data value, right? The y-axis is also data value. 
And the x-axis, the data value along x is mapped to color. And the data value along y is mapped to opacity. Does everybody know what opacity is? Who wants to tell us what opacity is? Visibility. <coughs> Visibility, like more prominent if it is looking more distinct. It's a good. Yeah, visibility is one way of saying that. Transparency is another way. So opacity is the opposite of transparency. Right? How tr so that means data, this is data value being mapped to opacity. Down here is fully transparent and visible. And up here is fully visible or opaque. So that means low data values are invisible or fully transparent and high data values are fully opaque. Here, low data values are black, but they're invisible anyways, so it doesn't really matter. And high data values are red. So we have data that's being mapped to color and opacity, and that's a transfer function, essentially. And here's what it looks like here. We have air. Right? It's invisible. We can't see the air here. It's usually not what we're interested in visualizing. Not always, but usually. And then, as we move up, we, we, start to, we want the skin to look yellow and semi-transparent. So that's what we see. It's yellow and semi-transparent. So we can see through it. And as we move up, we get to the bones. And the bones, we want them to be red. And we want them to be more opaque. Right? So the bones are red and more opaque than the skin. And then there's one more thing there. Does anybody see anything else? Blue. 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 The blue. What's the blue? Jaw. Teeth. The teeth. That's right. It's not shown on the color scale. They really should be blue here. So the blue, that's also like Halloween. <laughs> so the blue are the most, the teeth are the most dense, right? So the data values are going to be the highest. And they also happen to be the most opaque. So the teeth show up. So that's a, an example of a transfer function. It's also called a one-dimensional transfer function because data is mapped to the x-axis, the data value, and the y-axis. A little bit confusing, actually. Usually, what you have seen before, by the way, that what the only part that's really new is the y-axis. You have seen this in assignment one, where you just take a data value and you map it to a color. You've seen that already. That's something you know, that's, that's not, not new. It's just the, this part that's new, where you're mapping data value to opacity. That's the new part. Right, and it's given a fancy name, transfer function. So this is some example, that's some volume data. And then what, what you see from the volume depends on the transfer function you're using. Right? These are different transfer functions with data value on the x-axis, opacity on the y-axis, right? and then probably the RGB values being specified. So you can actually draw those transfer functions on a graph space. And that's part of assignment two. Right? So in assignment two, you're going to use volume visualization software. And then you're going to see, oh, there are these things called transfer functions where I have to specify which range of data gets high opacity and high and which color. <coughs>
and that's another example, the lobster. This is a volume made of lobster, so that's the surrounding fluid, right? And then this is the person adjusting the transfer function to remove the surrounding fluid or to make it more transparent. And this is the person looking at the exoskeleton, right? And then adjusting the transfer function until we get to the soft tissue and the, and the, and the inside. So you can interactively adjust the transfer function and see what's happening in the volume. Visualize what's happening in the volume. And there's another example. The foot, a person's foot, some toes. Close up your some toes. And it's a good place to stop. What do you guys think? True or false? <laughs> True. Happy Monday. <coughs>